in late 1994, you brought Buddy Landell back to Smoky Mountain Wrestling after two years away from the promotion and even showed enough faith in him to put the Smoky Mountain Wrestling title on him. I was wondering what made you bring him back after all of his troubles in the past. How long did it take for him to earn enough trust for you to put your main title on him? Oh, God. you know, right now, I can't actually remember the first time that it was brought up or mentioned or the, the first time the idea bubbled. But we uh, we started hearing and I started hearing that Buddy was really doing well and was, you know, behaving himself in a lot of ways, which he was. And, you know, was interested in doing something and had had lost some weight and got in shape and just would turn some things around. I don't know how we first heard that, but we established it to be true. And uh, at the same time, I, Les Thatcher was involved because, I mean, yeah, he was doing the TV at the time, but also his friend Bob Harmon in Cincinnati uh, was the uh, original Beautiful Bobby that worked with grand wizard and, and, you know, was one of the tag team champions in the garden in the late sixties. I believe it was, you remember who I'm talking about. Yeah. And he was on smoky mountain TV. Yeah. Well, he lived in Cincinnati and he was pretty good promo. And he, at the time now he didn't, he didn't necessarily look like beautiful Bobby. He looked more like a, a business distinguished businessman. And we put him in a suit and now he was a sports agent that had spent a lot of money to bring Buddy Landell into Smokey Mountain Wrestling where he was going to be the, the fucking guy and the top heel and blah, blah, blah. We didn't say that. And that's the way we introduced him. And, you know, after a while, uh, we phased Bob out of it because uh, Buddy was doing well. And and I don't think Bob went drive down uh, with less every month to the, to the tapings. Uh, but Buddy was, did great promos at that time. His work was best it had been in, in quite some time. He was even making deposits for me. We even gave him a couple of times, gave him some shit from the show's take to the bank. That's how, you know, like I said, good Buddy was making bank deposits. Bad Buddy would have fucking broke into the bank and taken some out. <laughs> so, but he did, he did really well on the, on that run. What were your original plans for him when you fired him in the summer of 92? First of all, what version of Moon River did he sing? Jerry Butler's or or Andy Williams' version? I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it. This was the exact Moon River higher than a mount. That's, the exact, that's the exact line that he sang. <laughs> you, did you, you edited it off the commercial tape, right? Oh, I'm pretty sure if we didn't, uh, I wouldn't be surprised because of the fucking editing situation at that time. But uh, yes, I believe we did. I'm pretty sure. I hope we did. What were your plans? Where were you going to go with Buddy? Well, it, it, that was the thing at that time. Um, I knew I definitely wanted Buddy Landell as a heel on the show. But it, it, for one thing, we were just getting established. I was going to see who was going to get over you know, from scratch. And secondly, sometimes you didn't know with buddy, you know, how long he might be around. So it's not, I, I would like to say that I would have intended to build the promotion around him, but at that point in time, I wouldn't have because he had not established necessarily at that point in time that he was going to be trustworthy enough to build the company around, even though he had the talent for it. Let's put it that way. Of course you turned them baby face in one of the more memorable promos of all time in 1995, but when did you first have the thought that Buddy would be a strong babyface in that territory? Well, as soon as he started doing well on that second run as a heel, because he was from Knoxville, and a lot of people knew it, and he'd been there for uh, wrestling in the various Knoxville promotions and in pretty prominent spots in a lot of cases for years. And plus, Buddy was the kind of guy with his mouth. Everybody around town knew who Buddy Landell was one way or the other, right? For good or bad sometimes. And the people, it, he was easy to get behind if you put him in that sympathetic hometown position. And it sort of was kind of like, I mean, on a much smaller scale, please, but it, I'm not trying to uh, say this rivaled the quest for the title of Lawler in Memphis in 74, but the same thing started happening as Buddy started getting over and being the top heel and just being the entertaining motherfucker that he was naturally without even trying to be a baby face or be funny for the people or whatever. Just he had that charisma. Some people started cheering for him anyway. And I, the, the idea I had for the Super Bowl of wrestling was that 
I would be able to top the night of legends that we had the year before, uh, it, not in terms of veterans and legends and names, but if I did something completely different, but in the same big show vein and had a title match from every, and this is the way we advertised it, every top promotion in the country. And the only one we didn't have was WCW because we had a WWE title match. We had Smoky Mountain title matches. We had an NWA title match with Dan Severn, uh, Al Snow and Marty Jannetty for the, uh, Midwest Championship they were using in Detroit at the time. Uh, Gary Waranchak and those guys up there we worked with. So up and down the card, uh, USWA, uh, we had a tag title match. So we had like from six different companies. <clears throat> and the main event I wanted, I knew, not only did I know I probably couldn't get the WWF Championship, but also at the time it was Nash, and I didn't want to have a stinky fucking main event match, to be quite honest with you in the main event of my big show of the year in Knoxville. So I asked for the intercontinental title, which at the time was Jeff Jarrett. But then that's when they had to clue me in that they were going to switch it on the pay-per-view the week before to Shawn Michaels. So a- advertising the match leading up to it until the last week, we couldn't talk about Shawn Michaels. We had to say that the intercontinental champion, whether it's Jeff Jarrett or Shawn Michaels, the winner of the big pay-per-view match on July, whatever the fuck, We'll be here in Knoxville to defend the the title against the uh, Smoky Mountain champion, which would have been Buddy at that time, right? So finally, the week before, and it's Shawn Michaels. He's a big heel anyway. I told Buddy, I said, cut the fucking promo, hometown boy promo. And he quoted some fucking uh, uh, too much time on my hands. I got dozens of friends and the fun never ends, at least as long as I'm buying and all that shit, and and told me I was not going to interfere because he wanted to prove he could do this after all those years of being his own worst enemy in his hometown. He was going to win a major championship. And, of course, the people are cheering the fuck out of him, and especially I didn't do anything through the whole fucking match. And finally, what I did do fucked up and caused Buddy to get beat through no fault of his own. And from then, and then all he had to do was to finally turn on me, which we milked till the following TV. 